No, not at all. Don't worry. This lecture is only meant for those who hate immunology. <laughs> Raise your hands, please. Come on, be brave. Those who run away from anything that starts with B cells, T cells, raise your hands. I want to see more. Those who have not heard, had any immunology since 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Where are the experts? Everyone else is the expert, right? You want to sh you sure you don't want to raise your hand all, all again? Those who are not comfortable talking immunology. Because if they are not enough, I'm going to the lake. Okay? Although it's cold. So that's the first thing. This lecture is for you. For the experts, and there are a few whom I know, and some I probably don't know, but I've seen your uh, uh, chart. You will have more um, fancy stuff later What in the day. What I, my goal today is that no one gets lost during what I will try to drive you through, which is understanding what happens between a shot, because that's usually like, I will concentrate on injectable vaccines, mucosal immunity will come later, and protection. Basic principles. So I took everything out, which I think you don't need to know. I even put... You know, a few things that I will say, you don't need to know that. It's really only if you want to, to be sure. But my goal is that at the end, at the coffee break, at the, at lunch, you say, wow, I didn't know immunology could be so fascinating. <laughs> and you will have a new mantra in your head. So be prepared. Second thing, don't worry about not asking questions because I'm going to ask you questions. <laughs> so. That should be fun. Ready? Go. How do vaccine induce protection is really what we need to know if we want to do a better job. Because unless you know how these various types of vaccines induce antigen-specific responses, you have no clue on how to develop new vaccines for those who work in the labs, but you also miss important clues on how to make the best use of existing vaccines, when to give, when to not to give, when to boost, when not to boost. I mean, we've heard that so many times over the over the last years. And really, there are a large number of vaccine types, and you're going to hear about examples of all these live attenuated viruses, inactivated pathogens, purified antigens, vector vaccines, mRNA vaccines have become very popular. There are others, of course. And what I would like to try to do is put something instead of this question mark for you to rely on and to feel comfortable whenever a journalist asks you, so, you know, could we start by how do vaccines work? And you go, uh-huh, and you don't have a lot of time to, to, to think about it. So what happens first after immunization? When did you have your last shot? Less than a year ago? Okay, how did you feel? Painful. The first thing that happens after most immunization is pain. There are exceptions. Some women are strong. Some vaccines are like water or sodium chloride. But usually the first thing that happens is pain. Why do you have pain? Because vaccines are meant to activate your immune system. And they cannot do that with water. So what they have to do is to induce, oh, he told me I should point on this, hold on to this, yes. What they should do is to induce local, what we will call innate, which is like immediate, make it short, innate response within hours. And this innate cell activation at the site of injection is meant to recruit immune cells where you deposited the vaccine. Because currently your cells are patrolling throughout your body and they are hungry, despite your breakfast, waiting for some crunchy stuff to come for them to get excited about. They have no clue where it will happen. So the first thing you have to do for a vaccine to be effective is to 
activate this innate re response and create an inflammatory focus. So inflammation, you've heard that word. It means red, swollen, painful. Sometimes you have systemic symptoms like fever, headache, and so on and so on. You know all this, and, 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 and of course, there are a few more specific ones. Then, through this inflammatory focus, your patrolling cells are going to detect that there are danger signals. Oh, this no, does not taste like French cheese or wine. It tastes foreign. Let's go and see whether it's safe. That's the idea, you know. Let's go there, see whether it's safe or whether we should do something. And if there is a danger, then they will activate And you see that uh, I try to draw this. I don't know how to print better, really. Frankly, maybe this is even easier. Uh, these uh, uh, cells, these dendritic cells, which looks like nothing, becomes really dendritic, like Shiva with many, many arms, capable of act attracting and capturing everything that they need to. And they start expressing many different molecules on their surface. You don't need to know any of this. Only that this is meant to get immune cells activated. And this activation, of course, is going to depend upon a number of factors. I listed a few. The type of vaccines. If you get an inactivated vaccine on alum, like hepatitis B, it's, it's, it's likely you won't feel anything. It's very, very painless in most people. If you get a stronger adjuvant, like some of which you, some of you may have received, although you're very young. Um, so no, probably not a lot of zoster vaccines yet, but there are others. COVID vaccines were not too bad either. And individual characteristics. I'm not going to go into the gender debate, you know, about women and male, but there are differences and so on and so on. Also your history, whether you've been exposed and so on and so on. So some of you are going to say this vaccine is a nightmare. Never again. And other side, I said, well, that was okay. And this depends on your individual factors. But what is really important is what's on the bottom right. This activation will trigger the cell. Oh, by the way, you have all these slides on Moodle. Right. Okay. Um, uh, the, to activate the migration of the cells into the draining lymph node. So lymph node is one of the words that I suggest you remember. Because in fact, where do immune response get elicited is in the lymph node. This is like the apero. Now we are going to real important things. So which lymph nodes? If you inject an inactivated, a non-live vaccine, a non-replicating vaccine into the deltoid, which we usually do, or in the thigh, as we do for infants, by the way, I'm a pediatrician by training, The draining sites are the axillary lymph nodes for the deltoid and the inguinal lymph nodes for the thigh. And one important thing for you to uh, see on this slide is that there is a strict middle line in the middle of the body. No crossing over. The immune system is meant that what comes from here goes to the right side, what comes from here goes to the left side. There is no crossing. Okay, so the draining of antigens and, and, that you inject anywhere is mostly local. If you inject it on the right, it goes to the right side, if you inject, blah, blah, and unilateral lymph node activation. And this has consequences for your daily life, or at least for the daily life of some of you. For example, I told you I was going to ask you questions. Which are the administration rules if you have a traveler? Who comes like five days before they go for a six month trip? They've planned everything, but they just forgot about their shots. And you have five different vaccines to catch up. Knowing this, what do you do? Different sides. Okay. So right and left. So that gives you two shots. You have five to give. Legs. Okay, they don't always like it, but uh, 
eventually it brings you to four if you take off the pants and everything, you know. And then what do you do with the fifth one? Space it out. Okay. By which distance do you have to space it out? One inch. This comes from infant studies with hip conjugate vaccines, whether it's a universal rule or not. Don't ask me, but it's a practical one. Uh, if you space out from one inch in the same area, it's going to go to different lymph nodes, at least in part in the same area, such that there will be no interference. Okay? So that's very useful to understand that this is why it is so. And when someone asks you what's the upper limit of the number of vaccines which you can give at one single visit, it's how much your patient is willing to take. <laughs> you know, never use the buttocks. Be politically correct. And remember that buttocks, although we, especially women, don't like to think of it that way, this is mainly fat. And in fact, there is very little immune cells. So the immunogenicity of a vaccine given in the buttock, in, in addition to the sciatic nerve and everything, is poor. So forget about this. Good. Now you have another class of vaccines, which are the life replicating vaccines. Like which ones? Hmm? Yellow fever? Varicella? Measles? Mumps? Rubella? And the replicating vector vaccine, I, in, I insist on replicating, which means going from one cell to the other. So these vaccines, what do they do? They are not retained where you inject them because they are live. So they do whatever, you know, like if you have adolescent children, they do their, they run their life, whatever you say. So they go out, they go out to meet friends, other spots, replicate, multiply. You don't like to think you're adolescent of doing that. I draw it back. Vaccines multiply, uh, uh, replicate. They are attracted by their specific homing receptors. Some, some go to the liver, some go to the skin, some go to whatever they have on the surface. But what is important is to understand that when you inject a vaccine that is going to go throughout the body, you will generate a multifocal activation of, of lymph node, right and left and up and down and everywhere. So it's going to be stronger and it's going to last longer because you will have antigen production for at more places and for a longer period of time. So of course, as a rule, and again, every rule has exception, live attenuated vaccines often generate a stronger and thus longer lasting, you will come to that, immunity or protective efficacy because of this imprinting and act, initial activation, imprinting is not the right word, initial activation of the immune system. So uh, this also has a very practical uh, uh, consequence for you, the daily life of some of you. Which rules do you follow when you have to inject live replicating vaccines, vaccines like yellow fever uh, uh, and varicella or uh, measles or whatever? Which type of rules? Duration. Time duration, four weeks apart. 28 days apart. Sorry? 20 days. 20 day. Okay, four weeks. Four weeks apart. Uh, or? Same day. Same day or four weeks apart. Where does that come from? Well, again, it's very shaky. You can find, maybe there is not a lot of uh, uh, support to that. But there are studies in which vaccines were, live vaccines were given at closer intervals. And when you give a live vaccine, you activate such a large amount of innate responses, interferons and things like that, that it may reduce the take of the second one. So the idea is to either give them on the same day or to split them apart. But, I mean, we can discuss if that's interesting uh, to you. It's not that uh, uh, strongly grounded into, into evidence. There is another rule. Uh, or another consequence of this is that really you can inject it wherever you want because viruses will make their way. Uh, and even if it's written on the notice that it should be given sub-Q, you can give it IM. If it's written sub-Q for one MMR vaccine and IM for the other MMR vaccine, you know why? 
It's just because one lab, one producer generated the studies sub injecting sub Q and the other intramuscular, and then this prepares the files that eventually go to regulatories and regulatories, they do their job. They cannot say, it's okay, I am, if it was only injected sub-Q. But in fact, again, sub-Q means intrafat. And so don't worry about injecting like everything I am, if it's easier, or if you think you made a mistake, in fact, you did not. The immune system knows exactly what to handle, uh, how to handle this. Did you get that? No one's lost? Good. Oh, I, I also forgot to say, I'm not going to be like, I talk, you should talk, and then we ask questions. Every time you see a question mark like that means if you have questions on this section, ask them. Otherwise, please wait because it may come just later. Yes? Can you say your name? My name is Angelique from the University of Cape Town. I would like to know when we are giving a, a replicating vaccine, how long did the replication last? Okay. How long does the replication last? It depends. On what? Very easy. It depends on the incubation time of the live viruses from which it derives. What is the incubation? So the replication time, the, the multiplication, the incubation time of measles. Measles disease, measles, wild type measles. How long? Seven days, ten days. Okay. So it's not going to start before seven, ten days. How long is it for chickenpox? Three weeks. So it, that, that's your answer. Uh, 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 a weakened vaccine is never to go faster than the strain it was derived from. And usually it matches very well because the replication machinery uh, is, is retained. Thank you. So now, how do vaccine induce protection really? It's very easy. Antibodies and T cells. I think I suggest these are the two, third and, and uh, second and third word you remember for today's lecture. Lymph nodes, antibodies, T cells. So far, so good. So I'm going to spend more time on antibodies than on T cells for a very simple reason, which is listed on this impossible to read slide, but which you have in, in Moodle because I uploaded uploaded the, the eighth version of the Plotkin book, not the entire book, but chapter two, which I wrote with Christian Evra, which is on immunization, a vaccine immunology, which contains much and more of what I'm saying today, and a few of the tables, not many, but this table you, you find uh, um, there, and of course, many more information than I can deliver now. So for those who want to know more, this is uh, the, the reference that leads you to other reference. So if you uh, gloss at this table, what you see is you have a list of vaccines. I, I did, of course, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, various types, and then you have whether we think uh, that their efficacy is essentially mediated by serum Antibodies, mucosal antibodies, mucosal IgA, so really mucosal antibodies or T cells. And you can see that there is, there are arrows or pluses almost for every single vaccine with very few exceptions. And the exceptions are the dark uh, gray uh, tuberculosis vaccine, BCG. BCG induce beautiful antibody responses, but we don't think that they are mediated a lot of protection. Uh, and the second one is Zoster vaccine, which also induces antibody responses, but we know they are not mediating uh, uh, protection. Okay? So I'm not saying T cells are not important, and in fact, we absolutely need T cells to induce antibody response. We need T cells for many things. You will hear about T cells later as well. But the most is important is for you to understand how do, do vaccine induce these antibody responses? Because these are key to protection. And they are key to protection because they can interfere or stop the infection at so many different steps. They can bind uh, to, to toxins, for example. They can block their diffusions, tetanus, um, diphtheria, rabies. They can prevent the entry of a pathogen into the cell. If that's the cell and this is the nasty virus, and if you put an antibody in between, it can't enter. 
Uh, and so that's another uh, mechanism which is very important. And you heard a lot about neutralizing antibodies. This is what it means, preventing this. They can also make um, antigens look so uh, tasty that uh, white blood cells are going to like jump on them and eat them up and then present them better to the immune system and so on and so on and so on. So antibodies really have a a, a vast array of action, and this is why they are so uh, important in the development of uh, our vaccine. They can do all these things, uh, and they are the only effectors that directly may reduce uh, transmission and thus contribute to community protection, which is, of course, an important part of uh, vaccinology because you would like, if you can, not to induce only individual responses, but also to protect those around uh, the, the uh, vaccinated person. So, as I told you, everything happens in the lymph node, and as of now, your universe is a yellow rectangle, which is a lymph node. And for those of you who have not looked at a lymph node for a long time, this is what it looks like. So, the, into the yellow square, you have the antigens that enter through the outside. This is strange. It's like they enter through the window. And then they try to, or they are translocated, which means transported into areas which are called the B-cell zones. And you may think of this as a, I don't know, maybe a soccer game where you have the hooligans on one side and the hooligans on the other team of the other side. They don't want to mix. So B-cells and T-cells are sitting at different places in the lymph node. You have a T-cell area, which is very big. It's in large gray. And you have B-cell follicles, where all the B-cells like group together, uh, 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 waiting for something to happen. And then, of course, once immune responses are elicited, they drain uh, out of the uh, uh, lymph node. And you see here efferent lymphatic vessels. So they will, oops, sorry, they will drain from there and, and go and disseminate through the body. But really, for now, everything that happens will happen within this context or square. So what happens first is you have injected antigen into, let's say, a deltoid, and it uh, flows uh, by through the lymphatic vessels, and it enters into the, the marginal uh, zone um, of, the, of the lymph node and the marginal B-cell zone. There you have B-cells. And some of them are really lucky because they, be, they have been waiting for ages for an antigen that fits their repertoire. And this is going to be an immunoglobulin at the surface on the B cell. So I'm a B cell now. Okay. So this is my antigen repertoire. And I'm desperate as every time there is something that comes like that and I can't bind to. But whenever I see something like that, wow, I get super excited because it fits immediately. So when I get super excited, what do I do? I activate and I proliferate, just like you don't want your adolescent to do. And I differentiate into antibody producing cells because I'm a B cell and the dream of a B cell is to make antibodies. So as soon as I see the antigen I've been waiting for, I become an antibody producing cells. There are a few tricks to that, but that's all you need to do. This is very, to know, this is rapid. This is a subset of B cells and it doesn't last long. Like many things that are rapid do not last long. I have to remember that I'm taped. <laughs> B cell, so this is what it looks like if you look at serum antibodies. You know, if you run ELISA, for example, and you bleed your volunteers every day and you get despair because nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened, and eventually something happened, first dose, around 10 to 14 days, 14 days after immunization, something happened, you see some responses, then you have a peak that is always between two to four weeks, more, more four than two, but sometime around this, in, in this short window. And there you think you already got it. And unfortunately, if you keep bleeding, you will see these antibodies will go down. And the return to baseline is rapid, months, which, I mean, in life, it's not like you, you take a paracetamol and you can take another one the other day, right? You, want, you give a vaccine, you want it to work for as long as possible. So this is not very effective. 
it's very good at protecting you immediately. And that's the objective of the immune system. Do it quick. But it's not very uh, long lasting. Got there? Questions? Please say your name. Uh, I'm Santosh with the WHO. Uh, maybe just one question. Uh, I think when you have the B cells, right? Like, and then you have the IgG and the IgM. So when the vaccine is kind of um, interacts with IgG and the IgM, what is the response in terms of the efficacy of the vaccine, like with IgG and the I We will go to that later. Correlates of protection will be covered by my friend and uh, followers, uh, Andy Pollard. I'm bringing you to how do you get IgG, how do you get IgA, and he will tell you what for. I have the easy job. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Ulrike. I have a question. Sometimes we say that if you have pre-existing antibodies, that then they can, re I mean, the, the response to vaccination can be reduced, right? Yes, absolutely. Is that truly mechanistically because those antibodies capture the anti antigen yeah. somewhere and then yes. just there's less there antigen? There are two points around? to that. C can you ask me that question again in a few minutes? Because there are two points. So my answer, uh, the, okay for anyone else? Okay, because I have two people. Oh, I keep the, uh, watching on the clock. It says zero, zero, zero. They forgot to turn it on. So I have all time I want. This is fantastic. So the question is, what happens? No, no. What happens after repeat exposure to the same B cell antigen? So it's leading to your questions. So I'm a B cell waiting for the antigen. I saw it when I got excited and I made antibodies short time and I raised these and responses in the blood. And then comes the same antigen. That's why I said I needed all this. Then comes the same antigen again. Okay, what happens? What can happen first is if you're lucky, is there are still B cells waiting around and they will do the same thing as the first B cells. So you will have a, a wave of primary response, and then a second wave of primary response. It may look like that, but every wave is the same length, uh, no, magnitude, okay? Same thing. If you're less lucky, what can happen is that every single B cell that was available has been recruited in the first reaction, and then there is no one to respond to your antigen. So you see almost no response, or you see a weaker response, and this is upright weaker response than the first response. And we immunologists, we call that hypo, which means lower, responsiveness. Not very fancy. Hypo-responsiveness. You see that mainly with polysaccharides. You see that mainly with, um, or only with vaccines that contain B-cell epitopes without T-cells. You will see why we need T-cell uh, uh, epitopes. So, it has implications because it means that you cannot give polysaccharide vaccines, for example, very regularly to, at too short intervals because it's like doing nothing because no one is going to be there to get excited and produce antibodies. So it brings me to your questions because when you give an antigen, the same antigen for a second time, what can happen is this, if it's a... a an antigen which induced no memory in the first place, or it can be antibodies bound to your antigen. Let's say you still have a lot of antibodies around. Okay? Uh, so as soon as you inject antigen, pre-existing antibodies will bind. And then me, as, an, as a B cell, I, I have no chance. So over-immunizing is useless. Because there is a there is a ceiling above which you can't go. And this is one thing everyone is studying or should be studying in the schedule, like how often do I need to boost because too too often is useless. More or less this is what happens. Okay? Got you? Yes, please. Yeah, Just behind you okay. and then Hello, um Pamela from Cameroon. And uh we have a lot of children who missed on who miss on their their vaccination one or more doses in their vaccination yes. schedule and later <laughs> <laughs> don't take it bad right it's just to save time yeah I know. i'm, I'm jalal alpha uh, from minor paris 
what what happened when we increase the the dose of the antigen later? <laughs> okay. <laughs> later this morning. Uh, I am Wahid from Pakistan. Uh, as you said that over immunization is useless. In our country, polio vaccines uh, mostly are given in 15 days or at least in one month during campaigns. Uh, can that work? There, there is another rationale. The rationale is you run a campaign, you don't hit everyone. So you run a second campaign a week later and you hope you reach other children. And if you reach the same twice, it doesn't matter. But it does not mean that two doses of polio vaccines given to one week apart is better than one. See? So this is a public health consideration, not a purely individual immune response uh, um, uh, question. By the way, when I say later, this means there are good questions because I have answers in my... Uh, so you can, for those who take the grades, laugh for the prices. Whenever I say later, it's a good question. Okay. So how do you generate good B-cell response? So this is for the aficionados. All that you need to do to know is that for a B-cell to be happy, it needs help from its friend. And its friends are T-cells. B cells on their own do what I showed you, a little bit of something rapid that doesn't last. But if they get some T cell help, wow, many things cap get happen. They survive better, they proliferate better, they make more antibodies, they make better quality antibodies, they switch to IgA, Ig, EIG, whatever you want, they they uh, in increase adhesion, they migrate better. So don't have to write down any of this, but T cells modulate B cell function. It makes it more diverse and it makes it stronger. And, and I will show you how. So back to the universe, which is the draining lymph node. Now you have a problem because you have B cells sitting on their, in their spot, T cells in another part and antigen coming from up here. So the, the question is, how do you bring antigen B cells and T cells together at the same place to be excited? And how to best get excited than by organizing a get-together party? So I know you're an expert at that, and this is why I choose this as a metaphor. This is a hint to my new life, by the way. <laughs> Organizing a successful party means you have to first define the best party place. It may not be in your garage. You have to enthusiastically invite all participants. You have to create a hotspot. This is not exclusive, but often it's the bar. Generate an intimate environment such that in guests feel like staying. Provide goodies for all to remain at the bar or around when there is nothing to drink or eat, you know, gets more boring. And at some point, you get tired, you need to clean up the mess, and so you want your partic your guests to go to an after event and get them out. You all know how to do that, right? This is exactly what the, happens in a lymph node to make a B T cell response. So, this occurs in several steps. First, the antigen is attracted, diffused through the lymphatics, you remember, diffused through the lymphatics and arrives in the lymph nodes, and it's going to go to the bar. It, follicular dendritic cells, which are little cells in the B cell follicles, are like, uh, usually I say like spongy, but here I could say maybe uh, more like uh, um, uh, the fridge or uh, the shelves where you uh, keep your bottles of everything that you want to to have. And they are retained there. It's like a mini depot of antigens that is captured there, translocated there by specific cells you don't need to know about. So you have antigen that goes there. Then your B and T cells, of course, they are not at the same place, but there is a place which is the frontier between the B cell and the T cell zone. By definition, if you have, you know, two different places, there is a frontier. And this is here uh, where exactly some antigen is brought by dendritic cells that have captured the antigen and are bringing the antigen to the 
interface between the T cell zone and the B cell zone. So you have a spot where you have antigen B cells and T cells. And then from this border, there are specific chemokines, specific signals that will attract the cells um, into the B cell follicle. So you have first the very excited and specific B cells, they do their job as they should, but that's what we saw before. But those who are lucky to get some help from their T cell friends, follicular helper T cells here, they get additional signals and they migrate to the bar. And I would like you to remember a fourth word, which is germinal center. Because germinal center really is the B cell factory. This is the bar. This is where everything happens. This is the place to be. Okay, because you have activated B cells, activating T cells, you have antigens presented on follicular dendritic cells, you have many other cells. It's like the craziest place where you want to be. And this is where they go. And this is where everything happens. You, someone mentioned switching from IgG to IgA or IgM. This is where it happens. Becoming better at uh, uh, antibody producing cells mutating, competing for the best, uh, uh, increasing the ability, affinity, whatever, if you've heard this name, this all takes place within germinal centers at the bar. And so from there, what happens is that the output of the germinal center is the met much better B cell. I'm very poor at drawing, so you see this is a small, poor little B cell doing whatever it can. This is a much larger plasma cells. Plasma cells is an antibody secreting cells, making various types of antibodies, migrating to the blood. And what you see as a consequence, mostly IgG, is a much stronger rise of immune, of antibody responses. Much stronger. Now, what happened then? These antibody plasma cells, they exit from the lymph nodes, which is a good thing, because otherwise can you it would be complicated walking around with lymph nodes from everything you ever received from your life, uh, during your life. So if you don't remember that cells have to get out, you know, just think of a lymph node is small. So these cells migrate into the blood. And unfortunately, they are not very happy in the blood because the blood is a boring compartment for them. They don't find goodies. They don't find many things. So 90% of the B cells probably are going to die. And this is why, despite the fact that you were so happy to see your antibody titers go up, it goes down. And within three months, you have up and down. But where it becomes interesting is that it does not continue to go down. Then you have a second wave of a few selected B cells, plasma cells, that will make their way into the bone marrow where there are survival niches. I would love to know what they look like. It must be really cozy, you know, with everything you'd ever think of to spend your life there. Because if you make antibodies to tetanus today, it means you have tetanus antibody producing cells in your bone marrow. Maybe your last shot was 10 years ago. So you have to be comfortable sitting somewhere and making antibodies and nothing else for 10 years. So a small minority of these B cells enter into the bone marrow and they are responsible for then making antibodies forever and ever as long as they live. And this can be for decades. We know that and you, you, you know some, uh, some examples and we can go back to that. So it is these long lived plasma cells that are responsible for the persistence of antibodies. And now if you again look at these, uh, antibody curves, you see that you have the, uh, uh, a strong increase, a peak, a rapid short decline, but then either a slow decline or a plateau. If you look at HPV, for example, vaccines, which are just fantastic vaccines, it's almost flat. It goes down so slowly that it's almost flat. And, and this is uh, thanks to the uh, existence of plasma cells that made it uh, to the bone marrow. So you have successfully organized a party because you have defined the best party place as the B cell follicle. 
You have enthusiastically invited all participants by cell activation and attraction. We have special names for these molecules. They are called chemokines. Don't, doesn't matter. You created the hot spot at the bar, which is the germinal center. You're never going to forget that in your life. This is a suggestion, also a hint to my new life. You generate an intimate environment by with follicular dendritic cells acting as madams. You want this, you want that. You provide goodies for all to remain at the bar. And this is the antigen and all the surviving signals that they get at the bar, music and everything. And at some time you say, now get out, I need to rest and clean and you go end your night uh, uh, elsewhere. And so this is the time where uh, plasma cells migrate into the blood and eventually make it to, to the bone marrow. And I hope you got it. Yes, please. So, uh, so it was very nice. I'm Farzana. You, I'm, I'm, I'm Farzana from India. So I just want to know, like, the, why some vaccines need uh, only one dose and some vaccines need repeated? Very good questions. Later. Okay. The short answer is, if your antibodies responses go down quickly and you need to maintain them for protection, you need another dose. That's the so short answer. But I showed you how it works. Okay. Yes, please. Fernando from India. Uh, can the antigens move freely into the lymph nodes or they are always processed by the inner cells before they move? Both. Antigens migrate freely in 30 minutes. If you inject free fluid antigen in a deltoid 30 minutes later, it's in the lymph node. And it's slower. They are taken by dendritic cells, monocytes, which get activated, become dendritic cells and bring it to the lymph node. So, so you have both Diffusion. And does adjuvant play a role in defining yes, this part? Yes, absolutely. You will hear a lot about adjuvants. This is exactly the issue is retaining antigens, activating more cells, and so on and so on. So that's one of the key factors of uh, uh, adjuvants. Yes, please. I don't think your mic is on. Is it? Uh, yeah. you, you said that the germinal center is created by the help of T cells. Yes. So, how much is the role of T cell epitopes and adjunct dependent T cells? You know, uh, so in, yes. in, in design of the new vaccine, yes. how these parameters are included? Yes. So, the best is when the same antigen provides both the, the chunk for the B cell and for the T cell. Then they are really, you know, the, the, the dendritic cells brings the antigen. Now I'm getting mixed with antigen. And so this gets into the, the TB area and, and this part gets, and this one, and this one, and this one, and they can be recognized by various types of cells. That, that's the easiest. There are specific vaccines and you will have lessons on this. For example, conjugate vaccines where it's more complicated. You have one part, which is the B cell part, which is the antigen. And then you have one part, which is the T cell part, which is the antigen recognized by T cells. And we know that if they are linked, this is much better than if you give them separately. So the best is to have everything into the same, probably area within the lymph node. Difficult to measure and prove. Yes, please. And then you. Hi, um, Tan Yui from Thailand. Um, you mentioned that there are two vaccines, BCG and Hobisoster, that rely on T cells. Yes. How come it's escape B cell? Why they have specific? No, it does not escape. And I will go back to T cells later. They do make antibodies, but they do not contribute to protection. Okay, so they have to, everything, every antigen that comes yeah. in, they have to go through all the party. Every antigen is recognized by B cells. Okay. At various levels. It's difficult to escape because we have a repertoire that is very, very large to, uh, to recognize almost everything. Thank you. My name is Grant from Uganda. I wanted to ask on uh, induction of plasma B cells. Is it, does it happen for all vaccines and what determines the, which factors determine the persistence of those plasma B cells that are long lived? I'm not sure I understood. So, like, if all vaccines induce long, long leaf plasma, plasma cells. B okay. cells. Okay, very good question because it's the next slide and then it's coffee. So, uh -huh. which are the key factors that control what you've seen? Right? You have local, uh, well, local um, initial activation into the lymph node, 
then you have the germinal center inducing plasma cells, then you have most of them dying in the blood, and then you have a long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow, right? So the key factors, and that answers some of the questions that were asked later, how can you increase this? Well, you can do a number of things. First, it's the type of the antigen. If I'm a B cell with uh, a number of uh, different, let's say they're red, blue, and uh, yellow uh, uh, receptors, and you present me with a purple antigen, it will not be easy for the B cell to recognize it. For example, diphtheria toxin is a much weaker antigen than tetanus toxin because of the germinal, uh, because of the repertoire of the B cells and the T cells. So the, there are some antigens which are really strong, easily recognized, and others which are poor. And unfortunately, this is something you cannot change a lot about, although nowadays, uh, structure vaccinology computer uh, is using computerized systems to change the shape of the antigen a bit, but not enough and not too much, so that it's better recognized by the immune system, but still close enough to the offending antigen. But that's the first thing. So, très bien. I didn't say. I didn't ask your opinion. Um, second, you can increase the dose. What happens if you increase the dose? Well, you recruit more B cells and more T cells into the picture, in, in, into the, the party. So very often, as you increase the dose, you see increasing responses to a level. And at a certain level, whatever you give is too much. So this is usually done very early in the development of clinical trials, and then they pick a dose, whichever, Micrograms in one company does not mean micrograms in another company, so you are con totally confused, but that's the, that's the purpose maybe. But one, then you stick with this dose and maybe you give half dose to uh, young children, maybe you give double dose to those in dialysis, but the dose of antigen is very important because it recruits more participants into your party. You send out more invitations. The B cell and the T cell repertoire uh, essentially is genetics. There are some who see much better some antigens than others. If we all receive a new vaccine today, something we've never seen, some will raise better responses than others, even though you all look in great shape. So without putting anything like disease or, uh, or anything into, into the picture. And disease, uh, treatment, anything that affects uh, innate immunity, adjuvants for the good part, immunosuppression for the uh, down, uh, dampening part, will affect anti antigen presenting cell activation and activation of T cells and B cells uh, and all that. So these are really the key elements of any design of a vaccine that you can think of is, okay, when I look at my responses, this looks like that. Where could I improve? Did I test all this? Did I uh, choose the optimal dose? Could, should I compare different adjuvants? Should I work with, and then we'll go to schedules and all that, but only after the coffee. And the persistence of uh, uh, antibody titers, which is even more important than the height, is exactly the same, except that you add the proportion of long-lived plasma cells, and that was your question. How do you do that? And the short answer is, we don't know. The only thing you can do is induce as much, as many long-lived plasma cells as you can and hope for them to survive better in the bone marrow. But exactly what they need to survive in the bone marrow is still very experimental. So that's the short answer. And we've learned that with COVID vaccines and, uh, and we can come back to that. Okay? So far, so good. Last question in coffee. For, for young children, sometimes we not be able to uh, give vaccine and activate uh, response comparing to adult. So my question is that are there any age or any time point yes. that... S sorry for blood? interrupting. There will be a specific lecture on infant responses. Mm -hmm. There will be a specific lecture on responses in uh, the... Those who are young for... Those who have been young, young for a longer period of time. <laughs> I like this definition much better. So at the two extremes of age, the just young or young for a longer time. And there will also be a lecture on responses in pregnant women, immunosuppressed, and all this and all this. So be patient, run to coffee, and be back. Okay?